So Professor Michael Berry earned her, his degree, a PhD in East Asian languages and cultures at Columbia University. And he, before he joined UCLA in 2016, he taught at uh, UCSB uh, for 13 years. Um, professor Berry is a professor of contemporary Chinese uh, cultural studies and also the director of the Center for uh, Chinese Studies at UCLA. Uh, Professor Berry's areas of research include modern and contemporary Chinese literature, Chinese cinema, popular culture in modern China, and the literary translation. His approach is truly transnational and comparative, and his work addresses the richness and diversity of Chinese art and culture in mainland China, Taiwan, Hong Kong, and other Sinophone communities. Um, he's a very, very productive scholar, uh, very active in many areas of research and public engagement. He's the author and editor of several books on Chinese literature, film, and culture, including speaking in images, interviews with contemporary Chinese filmmakers, a history of pain, trauma in modern Chinese literature and film, Jia Zhang Ke on Jia Zhang Ke, which uh, I assume is coming out soon, and another book, uh, The Musha Incident, also I assume is coming out soon. Uh, Professor Barry has served also as a film consultant, uh, being in uh, LA, I guess that's really obvious um, for us, and a, a juror for numerous film, fe film festivals uh, internationally, uh, including the Golden Horse in Taiwan and the Fresh Wave in Hong Kong. He's also the translator of several very famous novels uh, in Chinese, and most recently, um, he translated uh, Wuhan Diary, uh, which was published by uh, well, online at the time in 2020 uh, during the Wuhan lockdown by uh, the Chinese writer uh, Fang Fang. Uh, this is one of the earliest existent accounts of the COVID-19 uh, global crisis. Professor Berry is also the author of a forthcoming monograph about the disinformation campaign surrounding the Wuhan diary. We're really uh, expecting to read that uh, new book. So um, this year, um, the Institute for Chinese Studies at OSU has an overarching theme of uh, Sino-US relations, new perspectives. We really believe that Professor Barry's insights, research experience, and his scholarship uh, will help us understand Sino-US relations in new, uh, in new ways. Um, and he's not only, uh, he's, many people know about him uh, from the translation of Wuhan Diary, but he's a historian of Chinese literature and culture, studied Chinese speaking world in the past 100 years. So he's really integrated the historical perspective, literary criticism and transla translational skills so well. And uh, his work, recent work, uh, look at social media and the contemporary world from historical and transnational perspectives. This is so useful for us to think about uncertainty and crisis comparatively, which is the uh, theme of the CHR series uh, this year. Um, the subjects he works on and the theoretical and the methodological concerns uh, are extremely relevant uh, to us today. So today's uh, talk is entitled Disinformation, US-China Relations and COVID-19. Please join me in welcoming Professor Barry. Yes, go uh, Let me take one second to um, deal with one thing that I forgot to mention before, Michael, you take over. We will be having a Q&A at the end. Um, and feel free to put comments or questions into the chat if you want. Uh, they can go to everybody, they can go to a Ying or to myself, or uh, be ready to raise your hand and, and we'll all chat um, at, at the end. So Michael, take it away, thanks. Thank you, John. Uh, thank you, Ying. It was, uh, am I on mute? Okay. I appreciate the invitation and the introduction. It's really a pleasure to be here. Uh, thank you to CHR and the Institute for Chinese Studies at OSU. I'm looking forward to this dialogue and to sharing some of my work and experience with everybody. Today's lecture is a bit different than most of the lectures that I gave in my career up until this happened two years ago because it's not a typical academic talk where I'm just analyzing facts and history and cultural trends from a distance perspective. Somehow I got 
pulled into the story in a strange way. And so part of what I'll be sharing with you today is a personal story, but also trying to give it some critical perspective and analysis. And a lot of it is centered around a book called Wuhan Diary, which I became involved with almost exactly, as John said, uh, two years to the day. Uh, the diary began on January 23rd, 2020. And so we're coming up on the two-year anniversary uh, this week. And the title, Translation Diary, as you can tell, is a somewhat autobiographical account of my own experience translating this book. Uh, and so I think it's good to begin with a little bit of background about what Wuhan Diary is and who the author is. And from there, I'm going to really structure my lecture today around a series of questions. And I think that'll give it a little bit of uh, structure, and I really look forward to your questions uh, once we open the floor at the end for a dialogue. So Fang Fang is a writer who was not born in Wuhan, but she moved there at the age of two with her family. Uh, she was born in 1955, and so for the vast majority of her adult life and her childhood, uh, her college, her work, all of that experience was in Wuhan. Uh, she's a veteran writer, who started writing in the 1970s. She published her first novel in 1982. And over the years has published more than 40 novels, uh, dozens of books of essays, of cultural history. And the vast majority of her body of work is set in Wuhan or plays out against the historical backdrop of Wuhan during previous eras. So in some sense, when the COVID-19 outbreak happened in uh, late 2019, early 2020, she seemed like the person best poised to really capture what was happening and be the chronicler of this tumultuous and unprecedented moment in human history. I don't think anybody realized what all of this would turn into and that two years later, we would not only still be talking about Wuhan Diary, but uh, we would be living in this new COVID world or post-COVID world. Uh, Fang Fang was, in Wuhan when the lockdown was first announced and at the recommendation of an editor friend from a literary journal named Harvest, uh, the, the journal is called Harvest, uh, Shou Huo, he invited her to start writing a chronicle about what was happening during the lockdown in Wuhan. She responded with some hesitation and decided she would just kind of test out the waters on her social media account called of uh, Weibo and start posting some of her reflections about what was happening. The first one was, as I said, uh, January 23rd, 2020, and that was the beginning of this chronicle that would eventually last 60 days. The Wuhan lockdown was 73 days, and her, her diary covers the majority of that period. Uh, the chronicle, the, the diary was quite unique in that it wasn't a private diary that we, you know, keep at home and just record our own thoughts, but it was really a public diary that was posted online first on Weibo, later on WeChat, a, another social media app very uh, ubiquitous in China. Everybody uses WeChat and Weibo. So, uh, and the reason she went back and forth between these different platforms had to do with censorship because very early on, some of her posts started touching on sensitive areas and they would get deleted and it became a kind of cat and mouse game with the censors to try to get these posts out there. Eventually there was a Chinese American writer uh, whose account was a kind of principal mechanism, a middle, a middle person to try to get these posts out. She helped disseminate them uh, quite widely. Uh, the posts very quickly went viral and she started getting you know, two or three million views, then 10 million views, 20 million views. Eventually at the height of her popularity, the blog was being read by an estimated 50 million people. And so it had a massive readership, a real impact that seemed to cut across all the different official government media outlets and also non-official outlets. This became the conduit or the place that so many Chinese speakers, both within Wuhan and without, came to to seek solace, information, understanding. I think in some sense what happened was she was able to uh, personify the experience through her, this kind of reservoir of emotion. So you, it wasn't just a chronicle of what happened from a very cold, 
perspective that you would get from say CCTV or other official government outlets, but you were feeling her fear and her, uh, her outrage, her loneliness, all of these emotions came through very powerfully in her record. And I think that helped attract readers. Uh, the record itself is a mixture of the mundane. You know, how do I get dog food when the city's locked down? How do I uh, order food online with my phone? Little, you know, these little uh, technical things to how her family's doing, how people around her are doing, her colleagues, her neighbors. And then there is medical information that she's getting from doctor friends who are telling her what's happening at local hospitals, how many beds are available, uh, what's the situation with uh, the disease. People keep in mind, this is the very beginning of the outbreak. So nobody knew how is it transmitted? How contagious is it? Uh, what methods can we use to protect ourselves? So she's in real time putting all of that information out there as she's getting it. And these posts are usually uploaded between 11 p.m. and 3 a.m. every night. And she did this for 60 days. There's also incredibly brave passages where there are outcries against the government, against missteps, against dropping the ball early on when whistleblowers were silenced, when certain information was not factually uh, conveyed to the public, when it was told to the public that the virus is not transmissible between people. And later when it turned out it was, Fang Fang was quite angry and, you, and she spoke out yeah, with great uh, persuasion and uh, in some cases anger uh, at the government demanding accountability. So that's just a little bit about the, this diary and why it was so unique. So the first kind of question that I'm going to frame things with is how did this diary go on to spark what would turn into a nationwide political debate? And there were a couple of factors that needed to be in place for this to happen. Uh, the first is the massive readership, which I talked about, you know, more than 50 million people reading each and every entry. And then there are these calls for accountability. Uh, which also is an extremely sensitive and controversial topic to be broaching in China, uh, especially when you're directly calling out certain political leaders, which she did do. Um, that, of course, brings a certain level of hypersensitivity to the whole project. But there's also a historical precedent here, because in 2016, Fang Fang published a novel entitled Soft Burial. It was a work of historical fiction about the land reform movement in early in late 1950s, uh, late 1940s, early 1950s China. That book was subject to fierce attacks by a group that she calls ultra leftists. And when I say ultra leftists, we should keep in mind the left and right are flipped in China. So leftists in, in, in uh, Chinese political speak refers to those who are extremely loyal and close to the Chinese Communist Party. And the ultra leftists are those that uh, use political tactics that often harken back to the Cultural Revolution. And so this group of pro-CCP kind of activists, some of them retired PLA, People Liberation Army generals, started attacking soft burial. The attacks got so brutal uh, that the government actually banned the book and pulled it from bookshelves. Now, this is important because fast forward three years later, 2020, when this diary starts going viral online, it's those same individuals that attacked soft burial that come out of the woodwork and start to attack Wuhan diary. That's where the attacks begin. And so I, I think that's a key part of understanding that this, this, uh, the reason this, this book gained so much attention, it didn't come out of nowhere, but it also is tied to those uh, historical antecedents. Eventually, this triggers an unprecedented level of cyber attacks that are carried out on a number of different levels. Uh, the attacks are focused on a wide array of different topics. One of them is just the truth, or the authenticity of the book itself. One of the things, which is ironic, because one of the things that was so so vital about Wuhan Diary was the fact that this was a voice people could trust. This was somebody that was calling it as she saw it. She was, there was no spin to Fang Fang's accounts. The government did something great. She gave them credit. If they screwed up, she called them out on it. And so once the detractors started to attack the book, one of the first things they came after was 
this notion of authenticity and started to claim that it was all lies. It was hearsay, secondhand accounts. And so that was one line of attack that was used. And eventually these attacks got augmented into full on conspiracy theories. So the most popular one was that this was a United States conspiracy. And it was actually the book itself was produced by the United States as a tool to harm China. They, they called, they, there was a whole theory called the Di Daozi, the Di Daozi theory, which is the past the knife theory where it was alleged that I, as the translator, was actually a secret CIA agent uh, working with a team of translators working all night nonstop to produce this work of manufactured lies that would then be used by political powers in the United States and in the West in general to attack China, to hold them uh, accountable to pay reparations to the world for quote unquote, unleashing the virus. Um, there was also claims that the diary would unleash waves of anti-Asian sentiment in the United States and throughout Europe. Um, these are some of the conspiracy theories. It was also alleged that it was trying to make uh, intervention into the origin of the virus, claiming that it started in Wuhan, which if you read the, the diary, there is nothing about the origin, the scientific or uh, origin of COVID-19 in the book, and we never comment on it. Uh, but this is the kind of context that it got reframed in. And so we also have to keep in mind what's happening around this time. Well, these conspiracy theories start to go crazy around April of 2020. Uh, that's when news of the international publication of Wuhan Diary is first announced. But that's also when the US-China trade war is reaching new tensions. And this is also when Donald Trump is starting to make uh, public comments in the media uh, calling COVID-19 the quote unquote China virus or Kung flu and using other racist language to characterize COVID-19. This in turn exacerbates China-US relations and puts things in a highly volatile situation. And that's the backdrop against which I'm translating this book, Fang Fang is writing it. It's actually a work of simultaneous translation in the sense that I started translating while Fang Fang was still writing. So we didn't even know how long it was gonna be, when it was going to be complete. And as all of this is being carried out, um, these conspiratorial theories start inundating the Chinese uh, internet, especially platforms like Weibo. The attacks also start to get very personal. There are kind of rogue investigations going on into Fang Fang's private finances, her property holdings, her uh, history of international travel, allegations of her elitist entitlement. All of this is meant to kind of one by one knock her down, tear her down, and make this woman that had been just a month or two earlier lauded as the conscience of China, the hero of, of the pandemic, and try to turn her into a villain. And so there was a very sophisticated uh, network of discourse that was mobilized to try to uh, kind of destroy the myth of Fang Fang that had been built up early on during the pandemic. And these attacks are waged, uh, like I said, in a very sophisticated and multi-pronged uh, way. And this is just some of the ways in which these attacks manifested themselves. So firstly, this is how I first was uh, confronted with the attacks with just social media posts. So uh, the, the conspiracy theories, conspiratorial uh, messages, death threats also started to come into play. And the death threats, of course, also have a different type of function because they're used to silence people. Uh, once you're getting death threats, people are much less likely to talk back or try to speak truth to power because they they're afraid that the fallout is so so potentially high. And so death threats were employed very early on. And then you start having this full on disinformation campaign. Uh, and when people would try to when, when there were those rare individuals who would try to speak out and correct the lies, those individuals and their reports would be labeled as quote unquote fake news. It might sound familiar to those of you who lived in the United States around 2020. Um, and 
those individuals would also be silenced um, and there would be almost a kind of witch hunt employed to attack those who stood up for Fang Fang. And this had real life consequences. Uh, I'll give you an example of Professor Liang Yanping from uh, Hubei University. She was targeted uh, for standing up for Fang Fang and then she was the subject of a official probe by her university, an investigation. And, then, and at the culmination of that, she was stripped from her membership in the Chinese Communist Party and she was banned from teaching. And she was just one of many individuals, others including Professor Wang Xiaoni, a notable scholar and a poet was also targeted. Basically, it was uh, an attempt to silence this type of pro Fang Fang discourse on the internet. The book itself was suppressed. So there is even today no official Chinese publication of Wuhan Diary in book form. You cannot buy it in any bookstore. And many of the online records of Wuhan Diary have been erased from the internet. You also had the employment of academic culture. So professors being asked to write overnight, I mean, within a couple of weeks, publishing full length monographs attacking Wuhan Diary. You have popular culture, which is employed. Uh, and then you have an inundation of political narratives that are mobilized to fill the space or tell the correct story vis-a-vis uh, -vis what really happened. Uh, of course, the official political line. So I wanna give you an example of what some of this looked like um, with some images. This first image is my personal Weibo account. Um, and this is the message Box, the message thread under one of my posts. It happened to be the last post I had put up on, on February 10th, I believe, February 10th of 2020. I had hosted a, a round table with professionals from the UCLA School of Public Health on COVID-19, just an educational forum. That was, and I put an advertisement about that on my Weibo account. That happened to be the last post I put up. So this is where all the trolls congregated. And there was this message thread, which ended up being over, you know, thousands of, of messages, where uh, it was just inundated with hate speech, with death threats, racist speech. Uh, eventually, that post was viewed something like three and a half million times, uh, just to give you a sense of how many eyeballs were attracted to this. And that was just one of many. And this is what the attacks look like. I don't think I need to read through them. You can, you can take a quick look. But one thing I really wanna impress upon you is what I experienced and what this looks like is probably 5% of what Fang Fang got. She was targeted much more vehemently, and often uh, they, there was a use of misogynist language, uh, constant death threats. There was the release of her family's names and uh, addresses, emails, private information, all of this was disclosed online and her family members became targeted. It was really a kind of brutal campaign against her and it was a protracted campaign. It had lasted well more than 18 months and even today, I believe she's still feeling the impact of a lot of that. And so in many, in, 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 in some sense, this is quite, unusual and maybe you could even say the single the single most sophisticated and protracted campaign against a writer in China since the Cultural Revolution. And I know of no other writer, even we think of so-called dissident writers, which Fang Fang is not. Uh, people like Liu Xiaobo, they were not subject to this type of online harassment. But just give you a sense of the brevity and the, the weight of, of what this was like. You also had, the, these are the title pages of two of those so-called anti-Fang Fang academic publications. So on the right, you'll see a book and it's an ebook published uh, by Feng Chuan, who was a researcher associated with Wuhan University and it's called uh, Criticism of Fang Fang's Diary. And the language here, uh, Pi Pan, uh, Feng Feng Ruji Pi Pan, it really harkens back to a long tradition of this type of political criticism that was very deeply embedded in Chinese cultural discourse from the Mao period, you know, the Great Leap Four, the, the anti rightist campaign, the Cultural Revolution. So you start seeing this uh, resurrection of political speech that I think in the eyes of some, they thought maybe we had moved past some of that, but it all gets resurrected in this campaign. Uh, the one on the left 
Great Wuhan but Bad Diary by Fanaren. And Fanaren, if you understand Chinese, will know that just means everyday person or, or average person. So this is a pseudonym. So not even using a real name. And these are full length, you know, 100 to 200 page monographs that were produced. These were both released uh, around April and May of 2020. So before, uh, you know, the English book was even published, there was already the, the English translation was published, there were already these monographs analyzing uh, the original Chinese diary. You also start to see this type of imagery appearing online, uh, which again, if you're familiar with Chinese, modern Chinese history, you'll immediately think of the posters, the propagandistic socialist realist posters from the Cultural Revolution. But in this case, uh, instead of workers and peasants and soldiers, the three honored classes during the Cultural Revolution, you have what look like little pinks, which are the young nationalist uh, ideologues who are attacking a version of Fang Fang with a tail uh, portrayed as a dog groveling on the ground, writing her diary with the language, da dao di guo zhu yi zhou gao, mai guo zhe, Fang Fang. So down with the imperialist running dog, uh, traitor to her country, Fang Fang. And so you start getting these types of images appearing in the context of Wuhan diary. This is also when you start seeing critics starting to characterize the campaign that is gesticulating around this as the Cultural Revolution 2.0 or the New Cultural Revolution, the Digital Cultural Revolution. This type of language starts getting uh, used to describe this very strange phenomenon uh, that is growing around Wuhan diary. You even have big character posters, again, another remnant of the Cultural Revolution, which are essentially public denunciation posters, which would be put up in a public space and they had a certain formula. It would, it would call out an individual for certain crimes. It would often cite Chairman Mao, and then it would call for action to be taken, uh, some type of justice to be enacted. And these are no different. And I won't read all of the text here, but you can see, uh, you know, Fang Fang, one who consumes steam buns soaked in human blood. Uh, this is, is, of course, alleging that she's exploiting the, the death and the suffering of the people of Wuhan to make money and to uh, gain fame and notoriety from her diary. And they go on that they are on a crusade against Fang Fang to express my hatred for what you are done. Uh, and in accordance with the Chinese people's ancient and pure method of chivalrous justice, the attack against you will be both verbal and physical. And so you start getting these types of uh, posters that are appearing. There are people taking bricks and throwing them over the courtyard where Fang Fang lives. Uh, it's a real physical attacks. This is a WeChat group that was created called uh, Hong Si Xiaoping. So the little red soldiers. And this one says, Xia Xia yi ge hui shi shi na, na zhou ji shu kan Fang Fang de peng you chuan ba. So who will be the next one? Keep your eye out for Fang Fang's circle of friends. Of course, what the implication here is that if you are associated with Fang Fang, if you stand up for her, if you speak out for her, you will be targeted, you will be attacked, you will be subject to the same kind of brutal online hate campaign that so many others have been a victim of. And so it's a full out witch hunt that is launched here. And often, as we see from these multiple examples, often employing cultural revolution era rhetoric and political tactics, but now in a digital ecosphere. And strangely, as strange as it is to imagine, popular culture also gets employed. So here is, you might recognize Jay-Z. He had a song with Alicia Keys called Empire State of Mind. This song got redubbed with anti Fang Fang lyrics. And you can see the subtitles there, which say, uh, So I'm going to talk about an old lady, her name's Fang Fang, and they build a whole set of lyrics uh, that are basically attacking the diary. And that's just one of many. There's another one called Round on the Inside, Square on the Outside, uh, written by a composer under the pseudonym Bo Peep. Uh, and if you just glance at the lyrics, it's a greatest hits of all the attacks that have been playing out against Fang Fang. So accusations of her entitlement, um, allegations that the book is some kind of conspiracy that was produced in 10 days, um, 
you know, and it, it goes goes on and on. But you can you can find all of this online. They're even on YouTube. You can you can find the anti Fang Fang songs, anti Fang Fang political art. Uh, this is by a artist that is often referred to as the Wolf Warrior artist, um, in the spirit of Wolf Warrior politics, which you probably have heard of. And and this portrays Fang Fang as a jester, a court jester, holding her diary, which on the side it says Book of Lies. She's handing over the proverbial knife. We talked about the di dalza, the uh, passing the knife theory. And so here is her caught in the act, passing, literally passing the knife to this American general. And he is then crowning her with not a crown, but a dog collar to show her enslavement to Western ideology and political hierarchies and imperialist powers. And then eating it up, there is the Western media in the background taking photographs. And so this is again, you see the same talking points that are reiterated over and over again. And these types of images start to become extremely popular and circulating throughout Chinese social media. Here is one of kind of boxer type figures from the Qing dynasty burning uh, Fang Fang's diary. Here is another one with that Fang, uh, that's, that's uh, the author's pen name, her, her original name is Wang Fang, uh, but Fang literally means square. And so here she's portrayed with a square head. And there's this whole sequence about photos of cell phones, which if you want, I can break this down for you during the Q&A, but it's one of the uh, vignettes in the diary where she talks about a pile of cell phones left behind from uh, individuals who died during COVID-19. And because there was no disinfectant policies in place yet. They didn't know how to properly disinfect these phones. They just put them in a pile and someone took a photo of that. And that image, that description of an image later became the subject of an incredible amount of scrutiny and attacks from the online trolls against Fang Fang. And here is a, a further embellishment of that where they're in this series of images, they're claiming that Fang Fang just went to some some guy in the street selling you cell phone, she took a photo and then used that in the diary, which is <laughs> couldn't be further from the truth, but we can talk about this more later. Just to give you a sense of how powerful the way in which discourse around Fang Fang and Wuhan diary had been manipulated by censors, uh, I'm showing you here a word cloud image, which shows terms that were the most heavily censored words on WeChat from February through October of 2020. And if you, if you speak Chinese, you'll see it immediately. If you don't, it's the right in the center bottom. You'll see two characters that look identical, Fang Fang. Uh, so that's the writer's name, Fang Fang. And you can see that that's one of the most heavily uh, censored terms on the internet during that period smaller only than terms like Wuhan or America. And so it gives you a sense of how important it was for government censors to control discourse around Fang Fang and her diary. And then to show you just how weird the conspiratorial thoughts got, uh, this is actually a screenshot from a video that circulated widely on Bilibili and YouTube and other, other, other sites. But this actually claims that um, this is a year later. So this is early 2021, this appeared. And this is actually claiming that Fang Fang and Wuhan Diary are responsible for the abysmal death toll in America. And it's because Americans all went out and read Wuhan Diary and they believed what Fang Fang said. And because of that, they put their guard down because they thought it was purely uh, the result of incompetent Chinese officials and not a real threat. And so, it's actually Fang Fang who's responsible for unleashing this virus upon the American people. And this post actually calls for Congress to arrest Fang Fang and bring her to the United States uh, to face justice. So it is, uh, there was another similar post where I uh, claimed that the Freemason Society was actually behind Wuhan Diary. The American uh, branch of the Freemason Society were the ones responsible for this. So conspiratorial thoughts just got weirder and weirder over time. And so I think it's a good time to pause for a second and ask why. 
why all of this effort from academia, from pop culture, from political culture, from mainstream media outlets to attack, to defame, and to tear down this author and this book. And I think there's a series of important items that were at stake here. The first being who gets to control the narrative about the outbreak in China, the whole COVID-19 outbreak. And very early on, of course, there was no messaging in place. They didn't know how to talk about it because it was still playing out. Everything was too sudden. And there was just this cacophony of different voices and words and perspectives. But very quickly, once the central government figured out what their messaging was and what their talking points were, there became one correct way to refer to the outbreak. And there were certain talking points. For instance, you start seeing the use of militaristic language referring to the battle against the virus, the victory over the virus, all of that bits gets very heavily embellished. Uh, the nurses who donated their time and, and efforts to help in the initial outbreak in Wuhan are all called angels in white. And this type of this certain imagery starts to appear and reappear and get emphasized. And certainly they don't talk about accountability because the new message is that China did a great job. And in fact, they did after the first month, China did a tremendous job in controlling the virus. And they wanted to kind of exercise, excise or, or leave out those missteps during the first month. But Fang Fang was very adamant that accountability should be important and we should not forget those things that happened early on. And she continually calls for accountability. If you read the diary, it, it, it's a theme, it's a keyword that just uh, is, is continually emphasized. Now, that's a dangerous plea when you have 50 million followers. Because, and, and especially if they're not calling for accountability on the same basis that Fang Fang is, but what if they internalize those calls for accountability and start asking for accountability on any number of other political issues? I think it, there was the threat that this was a kind of Pandora's box and it could unleash uh, certain in political instability that the government was not comfortable with. And I think that's a major key to understanding how this dynamic played out. And then there are three items here with asterisks uh, one of them is international reparations. The second is the origin of the virus. And the third is US-China political tensions. I, I put asterisks there because these are all topics that have absolutely no direct relationship with Wuhan diary. She does not talk about US-China relations, the origin of the virus. She does not talk about reparations. However, if you just read the troll attacks, you would be convinced that that's all this book talks about. Uh, and so somehow this book, given the anti-Chinese rhetoric generating from the Trump regime, and given the tension unleashed by the trade war, this book somehow became pulled into these outside discourses and became part and parcel to that. And so there was, even though it doesn't exist in the book, there became a... Uh, kind of a sense, a sensibility among readers that somehow this book was going to hurt China. It was going to lead to reparations being paid by China to foreign governments like the US, like India that was also calling for reparations. And it was going to further exacerbate political tensions. And so this became a, a crucial part of what was happening. And finally, I'll say what was at stake was the very nature of civil society in China because irrespective of COVID-19, this was a woman living alone in her apartment in Wuhan, documenting what she was feeling, seeing, experiencing, and she was being attacked for that. And there was a large segment of supporters who believe in liberalization, who believe in a more democratic and transparent future for China, who felt why should she be able to publish these diary entries? Why should she be attacked? We should, they, they, there was a, a, a subset of society that was craving what she was offering them, which was a glimpse of a truly uh, open and transparent society. I mean, she was, she was calling out internet censors in this book and, and asking them to ease off and let the people vent their frustrations online. We shouldn't have to worry about being censored in the middle of a pandemic. 
so there's that's the one side. The other side, who are with the Chinese Communist Party and feel that, no, no, no. Even if there's a sense that, even if she had the best intentions, if somebody uses this diary for, in a way that might harm the political future of China, it should be suppressed, it should be censored, it should be flushed down the toilet. And, and there was incredible tension between these two groups. And so it became a kind of unofficial referendum on civil society, on what kind of society people want and for themselves in China. And I think that's maybe where one of the most important aspects of this book lies, that in the way that it stimulated uh, such intense debate and conversation and reflection about the nature of Chinese society itself. Now, eventually, the diary splits and we have basically a bifurcation of the narrative surrounding the book. So on the West, uh, it's eventually uh, published first in English on May 15th, 2020. It gets rave reviews everywhere from you know New York Times, New York or NPR, London Times, all around the world. They're uh, using extremely laudatory language to talk about the book. Meanwhile, in China, uh, official Chinese party tabloids like the Global Times are attacking the diary and calling it uh, you know, representing here distorted values. Uh, it's giving ammunition to antagonistic forces, meaning ammunition to the United States. Uh, it's weaponizing netizens post to create a biased narrative. So you see this complete split in the way in which the book was received. And you can even see that if you go to amazon.com, even now you can still go there and uh, look at the ratings. And they, for a time, they were split almost evenly half and half with one star and five star reviews. And the one star reviews were the trolls who were hopping the fence, so to speak, and trying to destroy the credibility of the book internationally by attacking it with those same lies about, uh, uh, you know, hearsay and a book of lies and using all, you know, this is a profiteer. All she wants to do is get rich. In reality, Fang Feng donated all proceeds she made from this book to the doctors and nurses, families who died during the initial outbreak in Wuhan. But you have this split that starts getting more and more deeply entrenched. So internationally, the book is actually translated into 20 languages. And so it's now widely available all over. There's a few other alternative kind of underground diaries that are published in Taiwan about what happened in Wuhan. But within China, it's been completely suppressed, erased. You cannot find any published version. Uh, a lot of discourse around Wuhan diary has been censored. But then this new ecosphere of alternative Wuhan diaries start to appear. So you start getting one by one these types of books. Uh, and uh, most of the titles are in Chinese, but a rough translation would be the diary of the battle against the virus, the Wuhan diary of the battle against the virus, the 2020 Wuhan diary. Uh, another battle of the diary, battle of the virus diary, the angels in white diary, um, and they go on and on. And you can just see how many of these diaries, official diaries were released and published within China to kind of take the place and provide an alternative narrative to supplant the one that had been suppressed by uh, essentially silencing Feng Feng. And often the way in which these diaries are framed is vis-a-vis -vis mm -hmm. Fang Fang's diary. So this is one of those uh, so-called official diaries. And it even says in promotional materials, is this another Wuhan diary like Fang Fang's? This is a question some netizens are posing after seeing this new book. And then they go on. However, compared to the controversy stirred by Wuhan diary, which took a critical stance, this one has warmth, empathy, optimism, et cetera. And so you see this kind of parallelism that is uh, being created between these different versions of the book. This is another one. This is the editorial description of diary of the battle against the virus. And you see in this description, I won't read the whole thing, but uh, this book reveals an accurate account again. Vis-a-vis uh, -vis the so-called fake account of Fang Fang, as they would accuse it to be, this book is real, vivid, heartwarming, moving. Of course, Fang Fang was looked at as critical, of introspective, of uh, 
doing something very different. And then, you know, if you move down, this is this book is our way of paying our respects to those frontline medical workers, PLA soldiers, and other comrades who stood at the front lines in the battle against the virus. It's suitable as a study guide for cadres, students, et cetera, et cetera. And so you see the way this discourse is shaped. In fact, even uh, Zhao Lijian, who is the spokesman for the Chinese government, probably one of the highest ranking uh, public officials to have commented on Wuhan Diary did so indirectly through this tweet where he said, the real Wuhan Diary, confidence comes from effectiveness, a foreigner's Wuhan Diary was translated into Arabic, from Arabic into English. And so again, he's positing this, this uh, diary by a foreign student studying in Wuhan against kind of Fang Fang's diary is this is the real thing, don't read, don't read that one. And the, in order to further emphasize that these are the real picture, you see all kinds of interesting uh, strategies that are employed. For instance, this one, which we could call the Diary of the Battle for Wuhan. If you look at the cover, I put an extreme close up here. There's a QR code uh, there. And actually when you read the book, throughout the book it's embedded with dozens of QR codes. And if you snap them with your phone, it will take you to videos and essays and all kinds of kind of documentation about the uh, experience in Wuhan. I would argue this is kind of creating a biotextual congruity uh, because one of the things that happened during the initial outbreak in Wuhan is that everyone had to have a health QR code. You had to have a green code to go shopping, to go to a store, to do almost anything. But what that did was it created a psychological parallel between this scanning the QR code and giving you a sense of safety, of health, of being in a secure place where everybody is either vaccinated or early on that everybody is negative from COVID-19. And in this context, it creates a parallel experience with reading about COVID-19. So as you're reading, you're scanning your code and you're getting a similar psychological uh, response as you would with your health QR code. But I would argue all of this uh, further emphasizes the kind of thrust to create the true authentic story of what really happened vis-a-vis -vis Fang Fang's now excise story, which is deemed to be inaccurate. Or, um, and so it was really fascinating to see the way this discourse played out. Uh, aside from those official diaries, you also had these unofficial ones still inundating the internet, such as New York Diary, which you can see they're knocking off the cover of the HarperCollins uh, Wuhan Diary, or on the right, that's called American Diary, which is a long running blog, very popular on Weibo with millions of views. And it's a satire against Fang Fang. And so it's written in the same form as Fang Fang's diary, but it's satirizing America and America's handling of the virus. And I couldn't help but put myself up there because I was the uh, subject of a few of the diary entries. I became one of the enemies or the targets of this diary as well, the subject of their attacks and satire. Uh, but it just shows you how sophisticated and how multi-layered all of this is. And so I think maybe this is a good place to pause, but hopefully I've been able to give you a sense of just how complex this disinformation campaign, which rose up around Wuhan Diary was. And I also hope it in some ways impresses upon you the fact that I hope you, you got a tingly feeling at times in the sense that what you saw through the lens here, which was this intersection between COVID-19 and the politicization of discourse, the rise of political, political extremism, uh, the effort to ban books, uh, the effort to curb uh, discourse on disease for a political motivation. I think we've all seen all of that play out right here in the United States uh, throughout 2020 and up till today. And, and in that sense, I think one of the lessons from Wuhan Diary is that Fang Fang not only documented what happened at the very beginning of the outbreak, but she also anticipated many of the intersections between disease and politics and racism, discrimination uh, very early on. And I think many of those lessons are lessons that we can take with us. We, we had a seminar this morning and I mentioned how Fang Fang repeatedly called for accountability. And in Wuhan, there actually were six or more, more than a dozen 
high level ranking public officials that were dismissed from office for failing to uh, respond to the COVID outbreak in a responsible manner. I ask you, you know, those of you here in the United States, how many American officials have apologized, taken responsibility or assumed any degree of accountability for the disastrous handling of the COVID-19 outbreak in the United States? Um, I think there's a lot of lessons and let alone the really unwavering courage that Fang Fang displayed in stepping up and documenting what she saw, what she experienced, irrespective of threats, death threats, attacks. And I think, for, at least for me, as a, as a scholar, she really served as a great model of courage and dignity and to try to do something meaningful uh, with our time. So anyway, I'm going to pause here. And I really look forward to your questions and comments. And I will hand it back to our moderator. Thank you all. So I'll just jump in. We have a question from David Goldenberger. It may be that we have answered, you have just answered this question. As he asked a minute or two ago, would you compare the Chinese population response to the one diary to the split in the US public opinion about the rigged US presidential election? Um, David, I don't know if you want to expand on that, but certainly that was um, um, implied in your final comments there, Michael about the split in the US opinion and, 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 and really the, the cultural mobilization um, one way or another. Um, perhaps the uh, uh, Fox News perhaps um, uh, plays the role of the, of the, uh, uh, the conspiracy against, against um, Fong Fong. Yeah, I mean, one, one thing that we see in Wuhan Diary is even in the diary itself, if you read the whole thing straight through, you'll see the last third of the book is probably more about disinformation and online attacks than it is about the actual outbreak. That's because in the diary, Fang Fang is getting attacked and she starts using her diary as a platform to speak out against these individuals who are attacking her. And at one point she even calls uh, these, what she, what she refers to them throughout as ultra leftists, but she calls them the greatest threat to the future of the Chinese society than any other entity. And that includes, I think, COVID-19. I think she, she looks at them as a much more destructive force than any virus. And, but what I think from a macro perspective, it, it does is it pinpoints the way in which COVID-19 seems on a global level to have created a smoke screen or a cover that to allow political extremism to fester and flourish and reach really unprecedented level. I mean, I spent my whole life in the United States. I've never seen the, the level of political divisiveness that I witnessed over the last two or three years. And, and but I think what it does is it puts this in a global perspective and allows us to see that we're not alone, that China is also experiencing something like this. And I think many countries around the world are also seeing this rise in political extremism, which begs us to explore you know, why, what, it, what are uh, the inner workings and the mechanisms that allow uh, a virus like this to somehow fuel these extra uh, viral notions of, 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 you know, I mean, the things like the vaccine, things like masks, they should have, these are public health issues. They should have nothing to do with politics yet, at least in the United States, even these have all become deeply entrenched political battles that are fought and continue to be fought. Uh, so I think the, the book really provides a lot of food for thought about how this happened and why it continues to be, has become so endemic. Um, we have a follow-up uh, comment or question from Dory. Um, do you, would you like to elaborate, um, Dory, or should we just read the question in the chat box? Oh, and... oh I don't need to uh, elaborate, but simply wondering um, whether it's possible to know about that larger online public um, were they more or less stable in their responses and the supporters just shut up? Uh, or is there some evidence that particular things in the disinformation campaign struck a chord and were successful in moving public opinion? Thank you. That's a 
great comments. So I think to some extent the trolls did win um, because once you have a playing field wherein, I mean, here in the United States, we have these different forms of polarization, but you do, you've got CNN and you've got Fox and you can kind of make your choice, right? In China, once Fang Fang, once it's decided that Fang Fang is a kind of enemy of the people, so to speak, her voice is silenced and there is no place you can really go for that to get the pro Fang Fang perspective or the more, or in a larger context, the neoliberal perspective, the perspective that wants a multitude of, of, uh, of voices to be heard. And instead it becomes the land of the trolls. And so if you go to Weibo, overwhelmingly, you're going to see the aggressive, violent, dark, negative comments that are you know, ruling the day. And also you have what, what are called uh, kind of VIP trolls. <laughs> and what I mean by that are, uh, these are individual Weibo users who are extremely popular. They're, I guess you could call them political influencers. And I'm thinking particularly of people like Peking University professor Zhang Yiwu, or a cultural pundit named Sima Nan. And they have millions of followers. Zhang Yiwu has, I believe, more than 9 million followers on Weibo. Sima Nan also has, you know, maybe 7 or 8 million, but extremely popular on multiple platforms. And they launch these venomous uh, campaigns and articles. And then they have millions of followers who then amplify that. And it becomes a cycle uh, where these types of discourses are replicated and become more and more deeply entrenched. And eventually, your average netizen, your average internet user, that's all they're, they, they become, they're that frog in the well, and that's all they're seeing. And, and so of course they're gonna think Fang Fang is the villain. Of course they're gonna think she is the witch of lies because that's the only perspective they have available to them. Uh, all the other perspectives have been denied. Uh, there are, you know, let me see if I can uh, go back to my PowerPoint real quick. I'll, I'll show you something here. Yeah, there are alternative voices, and I, I think it would be wrong not to uh, mention that. So even at the very height of all of the attacks where I was getting, I, mean, I personally was getting hundreds of death threats, thousands of attacks a day uh, during, this is around April of 2020, mid-April of 2020. Uh, at some point, I started to get these kind of love letters, you know, love letters of support. Uh, and and I got probably about 3,000 messages like this. And I'll just read this one. Not all Chinese people are like this. Please believe me. If you have the opportunity to explain this extreme behavior of patriots on Twitter, please also tell netizens around the world that there are also people who pursue individualism and liberalism in China. But I'm sorry that we have not done enough. It is still under the control of the government because in contrast, the comments of the ultra patriots are much more popular than those of the individualists and liberals. Even so, netizens who pursue liberalism and individualism in China have the same heart as citizens who are pursuing uh, those qualities worldwide. We still fight though the road is full of uncertainty, but we will never give up the pursuit of freedom nor will we kill the opportunity to pursue freedom by the acts of extreme patriots. Uh, I'll give you a few more. This one, uh, dear Mr. Barry, please pay no heed to the ignorant comments. Justice lies within our hearts. Freedom will provide the final judgment of what is right and wrong. Pay no heed to those who attempt to slander you with malicious comments. They are only using you and Fang Fang to release their frustrations. They are but a mind of the mobilists. And maybe one final one. I feel deep shame about the way netizens have been speaking about you in online posts. There's a deep fissure in online culture, especially during an unusual time like this. The road to enlightenment is long, as is the road to civility. Chinese culture is still on that road and moments of hope and hopelessness are inevitable along the way, but neither of us are standing on the sidelines. So those are just a small handful of the hundreds, probably thousands of messages of support that I also received. And so a lot of my talk, I was giving you the dark side, the kind of the underbelly, but I also want you to know there are, there is this liberal, more liberal side of the Chinese uh, internet and the Chinese, you know, intelligentsia out there. Uh, the difference is most of all of those posts were not public. Those were sent as private messages to me because they knew if they posted them, they would be attacked as well. Um, but I, I still believe there's, you know, there's a very diverse and broad 
array of opinions that uh, people represent along the, the you know, who have diff different political views on, on this. But unfortunately at the moment, because of the current political climate, because of uh, Xi Jinping's current policies, you know, what you're seeing kind of rear its ugly head is often the most destructive part of that or the ugly side of that. We have two questions um, in the chat. Well, I'm still muted. No, I'm not muted. Um, and let me let me uh, let me summarize. Cody Childs um, was and he asked um, was Fang Fang herself surprised by the polarized reaction to the diary um, in the light of the attacks on her previous work um, and the Wolf Warrior policy employed by the administration? Um, did she anticipate a reaction against her? Um, so even at the very early stage of writing the diary, there were already some attacks, but they were quite small and mild in the beginning. Uh, the deluge of attacks that came in mid-April, I think came as a complete surprise to all of us. I don't think any of us could have anticipated it. And I don't think there, there's no way be, you could have because the political climate had changed so quickly in real time as this book was being written. And so that's the X factor that nobody could have anticipated. Nobody could have predicted that Trump, Donald Trump would go on TV and start talking about the Kung flu and China virus, which would in turn unleash. And this is something I think probably a lot of people in America today don't realize is that we don't have Trump on TV using that nasty language anymore. But what he set in motion, you know, two years ago was received by people in China so in such a negative light that it set in motion an almost unprecedented wave of anti-American sentiment that um, is still festering and growing today in China in a way that is quite scary. I mean, the most popular films at the Chinese, I mean, my, my, one of my fields is Chinese cinema, the most popular films throughout the last year have been Korean war films. Uh, and we all know what China and the US's relationship was like during the Korean war. I mean, Zhang Yimou, uh, one of China's most beloved filmmakers, his latest film that's coming out, I think it's called The Sniper, is about a Chinese marksman who shot and killed something like Amer 130 Americans during the Korean War. I mean, these are the types of films that are being produced. And it gives you a sense of this wave of anti-Americanism that is currently still raging in China. That's my, my view. Uh, whereas here, we don't have Donald Trump festering and waving, um, yes. fanning the flames of this kind of anti-Chinese rhetoric anymore, but nobody's doing anything to try to lower the temperature, so to speak. And in China, the temperature is still going up. So uh, that that's something that I think probably anybody who cares about China-US relations needs to pay a lot of attention to because uh, things have been set in motion over the last two years that need to be reversed. Otherwise, we're looking at some really scary times. Mm -hmm. There is another question from Nathan um, Lochter who asks um, that given that Fong Fong's peak readership was about a million hits a day, uh, it's a big number. On the other hand, dwarfed by the size of China's population, do you think part of the scale of the response is drawn was to drown out any notions that might have come from Fong Fong's original readership. Um, do you think there are any important effects related to the sheer numbers at play here? Yeah, it's hard to see, you know, in those numbers, I even, even the 50 million number, you know, these are all estimates because you, you can quantify how many hits, uh, you know, mm -hmm. a certain post gets on social media, how many times it's been read. But because there was this cat and mouse game being played out to suppress her posts, a lot of it was not disseminated that way. There were people that were saving her posts into PDFs and then emailing them to friends. Some were then shared on WeChat or on other platforms. I, I, I suspect that the overall readership is much, it's probably in the hundreds of millions uh, in terms of the number of readers that Read, it, read at least some portion of Fang Fang's diary. It's just very, very hard to quantify. But 
without question, among the numerous platforms that were covering the outbreak in Wuhan from February through March, Fang Fang was the single most influential non-official outlet that people were coming to. I, I can say that pretty confidently. I can't, I don't, I don't know if she reached the same numbers as CCTV or Xinhua reached, but for non-official outlets, certainly she was the go-to platform. And that created a incredible threat for anything in China, like Falun Gong, why was that so vehemently suppressed? Just it's because any organization that has that much power and sway and pull and influence on a large group of people is a threat to the one party leadership in China, especially if that organization is singing a tune that goes against certain policies. And, and, and I think some of Fang Fang's content certainly uh, they, they viewed as a threat. But I also wanna make clear Fang Fang was never a dissident. She never says, you know, overthrow the government. She never, she's actually, um, and, and actually real dissidents read Fang Fang's diary and they're disappointed that she's too mild and too tame. And they say, that's it. That's, you know, and there's actually, there are criticisms you can find of her online that she's just a government hack and that she actually didn't, you know, wasn't aggressive enough in her criticisms. And so it's, it's a really kind of interesting <laughs> uh, situation at play. I don't, did I address the question there? I, I mean, I I've, think so. Yeah. Yeah. Let's, Nathan, you want to pop out from behind the screen and. Um, well, we have Sophie's question about whether you like to compare the narrative of the Wuhan lockdown to the more recent lockdown of the Xi'an lockdown um, from the end of 21 to the present. In other words, how I mean, a broader issue would be really how is this playing now? What is happening um, in real time in China as, as we have a second lockdown? Um, some of us cynics might point to the um, the Olympics and say that might yeah. be. Yeah, thank you, Sophia. Um, yeah, it's a really interesting question because it also points to the way in which these narratives are not fixed and they change with ebbs and flows over time. So Fang Fang began as being lauded by most readers in China, really had an extremely positive response to Fang Fang's diary initially. It was in mid-April of 2020 that the discourse was shifted and I hopefully I showed you uh, how that played out and how that was orchestrated through so many different channels in order to kind of shift the discourse and tell the so-called good China story, which is something that Xi Jinping has been advocating, kind of the proper story, the politically correct story. And so for the last, and, and Fang Fang has essentially been silent. She's not been able to do interviews. She's not been able to publish her work uh, for the last 18 months or so. Uh, it's, it's really, uh, you know, a kind of precarious situation that she is still in. And during that time, you haven't seen a lot of pro Fang Fang discourse that's been out there on the Chinese internet, but we're now seeing a shift with the Xi'an lockdown and certain individuals who have been extremely frustrated by what they're calling, you know, human rights violations or feeling that certain heavy handed nature of the lockdown is, kind of inhibiting their personal freedoms. I saw a video yesterday of a man screaming out uh, to wanting to see his mother who is uh, dying. And they wouldn't let, even though he's tested negative and he has the green QR code, they wouldn't let him in to see his mother before she died. And he posted this venom uh, kind of tirade on, on Chinese social media. And it's against that context that now Fang Fang's diary is being reevaluated. And you're starting to see a deluge of comments of people saying, where is our Fang Fang? We need Fang Fang. Where is uh, Xi'an's Fang Fang? And this kind of, uh, these kind of cries. And so I think it, it's, it shows the lasting power that uh, this, this diary had and that even those people who have been silent for the last two years, they remember. And I think there's, there's still a, they still, they know what Fang Fang did early on and they remember. And now they're, I think, craving for, for, for a voice like that to speak on their behalf and speak up for them. And I think that's really what the diary did for so many individuals who felt silent and they felt like they couldn't articulate their emotions, their fears, their anger, and Fang Fang did that for them. So I could jump in and kind of, I mean, 
put the spin on what you've been saying, which is, I mean, pretty explicitly saying that this is less a COVID crisis, a disease, an epidemic crisis. It's an epidemic crisis that is situated and has launched a, a crisis of legitimacy, a crisis of, of a crisis of state. Yeah, I don't know if I call it state because in the sense that I think Xi Jinping is in, he is not worried. Early on, there was talk of COVID-19 being a China's so-called Chernobyl moment. There were, there were people in the press framing it that way. I don't know if, uh, and I think there was a great fear that this could unleash certain political instabilities. However, very quickly, as soon as the West started to trip over itself in dealing with COVID-19, the Chinese government started to look very good compared to the UK and the US and Italy and so many other countries. And it actually became a political boom for them because it gave them unprecedented political legitimacy. And it gave them, uh, they were able to tap into an incredible wellspring of goodwill among the people who felt my government cares for me. They're taking care of me. They're keeping me safe. They're getting vaccines for me. Unlike America and all these Western so-called democracies, they're not doing a very good job, but China is doing great. And, and actually, especially among young, younger generation kind of uh, who you know grew up under the red flag and they, uh, I think you, that triggered an, a really unprecedented explosion of nationalist sentiment. Uh, for the Chinese Communist Party. So I don't know if there, so, so you have that playing out on the one hand. At the same time, you still have this, you know, like Fang Fang's generation and this other demographic that is still craving for more liberalization. And they don't like the heavy handed nature at which Xi Jinping has been clamping down on individual rights and things. And so it's, it's, a, it's a real mixed bag, but I would say it's a tale of two viruses. On the one hand is the COVID-19, on the other hand, it's disinformation, it's political extremism. So I, I don't know if I would call it a full on political crisis, you know, that, but, but it's certainly a crisis of political extremism and, uh, and, and a virus of this disinformation. Well, or one could say that it had the potential to become. And it, and it did, yeah, yeah I, I th and, and that potentiality, I think that's, that potentiality is what is behind all of this crackdown against the book. You mm -hmm. know, it's the, mm -hmm. yeah, um, yeah it's, it's, that's the kind of X factor that they're trying to, I, I think there, there was, the, in, in the manuscript I've been writing, I, I even mentioned this sci-fi film by Steven Spielberg called, Minority Report. Are you guys familiar with this? Where Tom Cruise, uh, they look into the future and then they stop future crimes from being committed before they actually happen. And in some sense, I feel like that's what this book was in that Fang Fang didn't, there, there was an anticipatory impulse that this book would be used by the West to defame China or to be weaponized against China it would be, but none of that ever happened. And if you read the book, it, it's impossible any of that would ever happen. But in order to curb potentialities and to uh, the book, it was decided we need to sacrifice this book. We need to kill it and we need to silence the author. So there have been some questions about Weibo um, uh, that essentially is suggesting it's like 4chan, which is a space of hyper conservative conspiracy theories. Um, sounds like Weibo is more of a a, a, a mainstream a mainstream um, blog. Yeah, if you're not if, if you're not familiar with Weibo, it's a it's probably the single most popular social media platform in China. It's kind of a hybrid between Twitter and Facebook. Both Twitter and Facebook are banned in China. And so China created its own homegrown social media platform. And that is, and Weibo is by far, I think, the most widely used one. And over the last several years, the type of posts that you're seeing there uh, have been in. I, I have a lot of friends who stopped using Weibo uh, in China simply because it's become so conservative and intolerant and 
that the kind of abusive language that is appearing has become more and more common. I think Ing has a question. Yes, thank you so much for um, this very thoughtful and interesting presentation and answering um, the audience question. I, I was uh, actually um, kind of during the seminar today and during your talk and during the Q&A session, uh, I kept thinking about um, the 17th century global crisis that me, I and some of my colleagues work on um, and uh, the, the theme of crisis uh, and also what John just mentioned about sort of the global the different temporalities of crisis um, that we're living in and experiencing and kind of this, this, this continues to evolve, right? So what you just mentioned uh, about sort of this, I, I feel like the Chinese still feel like they are part of the global crisis. And what happens in the United States, um, both on the public health uh, front and also the political sort of the problems we have over here, affect the Chinese and could create more crisis for them. So there's this sense of like being sworn in this global crisis, I think among Chinese, this isn't probably there's this sentiment like that as well. So I just uh, um, wondered if you could talk a little bit about sort of um, this from, uh, you know, in, in our field, 17th century global crisis, we talk about whether this, the, global, the, the, the little ice age, climate change has triggered everything. And, or there was a human dimension of this and which one com comes first and if they were continuing sort of, you know, changing landscape of crisis. It's, that's the question related to John's. Um, and also lastly, I guess, I would just ask you to talk a little bit about sort of the scholars analytical distance from this, um, uh, and uh, so for us, the historical distance is so important in <laughs> scholarship. Um, and I use your translation of Song Fang's diary in my own research. And I'm very anxious about being accurate <laughs> in, my, um, in my representation of your translation of someone's diary uh, as all this is evolving, unfolding. So I'm just wondering if uh, you can talk a little bit about how you maintain this kind of scholarly distance, analytical distance um, for us. Thanks so much. Thank you. Um, I mean, starting with the second part of your question about distance, I think it would be disingenuous of me to claim I have real distance in this particular case because I was so close to the whole project. I actually, so it started out just as a blog and I was the one who texted Fang Fang and said, uh, how about, I, 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 just to give you a little bit of backstory, I was translating one of Fang Fang's novels, Soft Burial, the one that I mentioned had been attacked in 2017. And when I started reading her, her diary, I texted her and said, you know what, I think this is such an important document you're creating, a testament to what's playing out. What do you say I put aside Soft Burial and I just translate this for now because I think it's so important to get this out. And she initially refused and then, because she just thought it was premature, she was still writing the book, it wasn't complete, she didn't know how long the diary would last for. And then about a week later, she came back and said, Let, let's do it. And I started translating. And so I, from the very inception, you know, I was kind of tied into this project, I got pulled into, you know, be a target of the attacks. And, and so I think it, it's just, for me, it, there's no real distance I've, I've been and, 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 and so step one is to just be very forthright about that in my scholarship that I don't have the type of critical distance that another scholar might have who's approaching this at the same time I do have this firsthand knowledge and firsthand experience which other people don't have and so you try to take advantage of those unique things you can bring to the table at the same time being very forthright about the shortcomings in terms of not being able to have a purely, but what is objectivity anyway, right? We all are brainwashed by our experience and our language and our, uh, if you have a religion or, you know, where you grew up, all of these things impact how, how we approach history and how we approach various cultural objects. And so I think it's just trying to be very forthright about that. But it did give me a, a type of ethical commitment to scholarship that I don't think I ever 
really had. I thought I had it. You know, I wrote about, I've written books about trauma and always tried to do work that was engaged and important. Uh, but this really was a game changer for me in terms, because what it means experientially when you become the subject or the target of daily death threats. And I mean, it really changes something inside you in terms of what it means to be a scholar and, and the type of engagement that you're doing with the public. Um, so just to give you one example, just two nights ago, I finished my translating my third book by Fang Fang. And so uh, this last two years, you know, it began with Wuhan Diary and I went back and I translated Soft Burial. And then I just finished a third novel by her. And part of that is, again, I, I for, in my view, it's part of this ethical commitment to keep her voice alive when right now in China, she cannot be published. No publishers are distributing her work. And having gone through this with her, I just felt uh, such, it, it's just of such vital importance to make sure her voice gets out there. And if the only audience that can read her right now is an international audience, so be it. But um, to try to keep that, keep that voice alive and pay my, my respect to, the incredible act of bravery that she exhibited by documenting what happened and kind of providing this wake up call for all of us. Not all of us got the message and, you know, internalize those lessons about social distancing and about uh, taking basic steps and precautions we can uh, to prevent the virus from spreading. And I mean, it's all there early on in the, in the, in the book. Um, but nevertheless, she did, she did her best. And, and I feel like I have to try to do my best to amplify her voice. And then your first part of your question was about the global reverberations, right? And the global connections of this. And I think we are, I mean, they're deeply, deeply intertwined. And especially I talked a lot about the China US trade war and the way that exacerbated things uh, in the context of Wuhan diary, but in a much broader perspective or a macro perspective, you can also see the way in which the irreverence to political norms displayed by Donald Trump gave a certain uh, blessing. It kind of became uh, various dictators around the world took that as the, you know, America for better or for worse had been the global policeman or tried to be the global policeman for, for many, many decades. And I think a lot of that went out the window during the last couple of years. Uh, not that everything they did under that guise was necessarily justified or proper, but it, at the very least, it, there was a certain balance of powers globally that was created by that type of a political uh, ecosphere that had been created. And once that went out the window and we had basically, I, I hope I'm not offending anyone here, but basically a thug in the White House who was, uh, uh, not paying heed to all of these, you know, business as usual, right? It, it created a precedent by which dictators around the world, from the Philippines to, you know, China, all over, felt like this is our chance to really uh, do what we wanted. I mean, look what happened in Hong Kong. It's no coincidence that happened under the watch of Donald Trump and under the cloud of COVID. Um, and so there are deep consequences to what happens when you have one major power that's kind of facing this uh, internal crisis, it creates a cycle of destabilization, or at the very least, uh, a cycle of political consequences that get unleashed in different regions around the world, some of which will have consequences that we won't fully be able to unpack maybe for years to come. I think that was a great summation. And so what I would like to do, unless there's a pressing issue on the table, I would like us all to put our hands together and thank Michael for a spectacular, um, actually two events. We had a nice colloquium earlier and then this seminar. So thank you, thank you, thank you.